Hi there, welcome to Fireside with Peter Adkisson here on Gen Con TV, streaming live from Caldea Studios. My host today, oh, I'm the host. <laughs> my host today is Peter Adkisson. I'm Peter Adkisson. My co-host is Emma Larkins, and our guest today is Ryan Dancy. As you know, on this show, we go in search of the untold stories behind your favorite games, and we are covering Dungeons & Dragons now. And our guest today has a lot of great stories. His whole life is a great story. He was very central to the whole deal between Wizards and TSR and getting bought, and you're going to hear it live from Ryan today, right now. Ryan, woohoo! Thanks woo for coming. We're glad to be here. Super excited. <laughs> oh, no, seriously, I really, really appreciate you coming down. Yeah. yeah. So um, I always like to start with a little bit of like, who were you before Wizards of the Coast, before, I almost said Magic the Gathering, but yeah, before Magic the Gathering. Um, mm. I mean, I remember, I think I met you at DreamCon yep. in what, 1993? Yeah, just before Magic, probably 92 or 93. 92, yeah. before yeah. Magic, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, we knew each other before Magic, because we, you were you were going around to the local convention selling Primal Order. Yes, yeah. I was, yes, <laughs> Wizards of the Coast, first product. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yep, Primal Order. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody in Washington State had a copy. Yes, <laughs> yes, and both my friends. It was the new hotness. <laughs> yes, the new hotness, uh, yes. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I, I met you there, and you had an ISP company, yep. is that right? Tell yep. us about hmm. yeah, yeah. I, uh, I was fortunate enough to co-found one of the first regional internet service providers in the nation, uh, kind of on accident. A lot of my life is like, we started off to do one thing, and then an accident occurred, and then and that right. turned out to be great. Uh, so yeah, we, uh, we formed a company called Isomedia, and it was a regional ISP, and that kind of got us our fingers into a whole bunch of pies, just kind of helping people move big files around and connectivity and that kind of Wild West stage, early 90s, when you know the internet <laughs> was something people didn't really understand. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm trying to remember, like, what was an ISP? This yeah. was before you just plugged into the internet. universal. Yeah, that's right. Service right. provider. Internet. Yeah. internet service provider, right? Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right. Yeah, you had to pay somebody to, on your modem, call up to connect to get on the internet. Right, yeah. right. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and then that somehow you got into mail order through yeah. that, right? Yeah, we uh, at the time I was uh, I had a small child at home, and yeah. we wanted to restart our D and D campaign because that's something you can do when you have a baby. Like baby right. sits in the crib, everybody plays D and D, <laughs> um, and we were really poor, and we didn't want to pay full price for our products, our you know our gaming products, because we had basically had to rebuy all our libraries. Everything had gotten lost or misplaced down through the years. And we formed a fake mail order company um, so we could pay wholesale prices. And, uh, and it turned out that there was a need for that company and we started to get a lot of orders. And um, our fake mail order company turned out to be a real, which has nothing to do with providing internet service to anybody. Right. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so it was all on the up and up retroactively. That's right. In, in the end, it all worked out great. Yeah, right, that's right, right. There was right, a, a local right. distributor here who I have very fond memories of who kind of looked at us and thought, I don't know what this is, but it's probably harmless. And, Right. And it all worked out really well. Hmm. Right, yeah. right. So somehow you got from there into, uh, I mean, I kind of, I knew you, you were out there. I, I'd always had a great impression of you. There was a part <laughs> of me that always was hoping that uh, we would work together yeah. somehow, somewhere, sometime. Hmm. Yep. Uh, but you ended up working with John Zinzer, yep. our good friend uh, yep. who runs AEG. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We, um, through a, a whole series of events that are probably outside the scope of this conversation, <laughs> we ended up publishing a trading card game called Legend of the Five Rings, mm. uh, L5R. And uh, that game was a, a door that opened to the whole world of hobby gaming for me. John was already there. He was publishing a thing called Shadus Magazine. Right. And uh, in the process of making that game and then making a company to publish that game called Five Rings Publishing Group, we hired a guy named Bob Abramowitz who weirdly, coincidentally, had worked for TSR as like a 20 year old and he right. knew the owner of TSR. Yeah, but before we get to that, yes. he, you hired him to help you raise, raise, money. raise money. That's right, yeah. To do Legend of the Five Rings, yep. to, pu to publish L5R. Yeah, that's right, yeah. We, right. we managed to publish the first print run of L5R on, on the backs of you know friends and family money. Um, yes, yes. My parents mortgaged their house, <laughs> oh, so we could publish that game. Uh, and one of my business partners at the time, uh, Bruce, he uh, cashed in a bunch of stock in Costco. And uh, you know we got her done, um, but it was it was uh, I, f fam famously um, I, I am known to have been under my desk at certain points with my head in the in the waist can like the stress level I wasn't always gray haired like, <laughs> the stress level was very high mm. um, yeah. but we got yeah. the first print run done and 
we needed to raise more capital. Uh, you know, trading card yeah. games are a very capital-intensive business. It costs a lot of money to print, and you have to pay up front. Right. Um, and yeah, so we we had tried to raise cash, and we just were having a really hard time. And we, through a very series of connections, we met this guy named Bob. And Bob, well connected in the Seattle area, knew a lot of people with uh, money to invest, and he he made it happen. He was a rainmaker. So, so he went out and helped to raise uh, yeah, a he bunch of money. Yeah, he raised three quarters of a million dollars uh, right. was the initial investment. I mean, that's, that's good money oh, for yeah. um, a hobby game publishing and a bunch of company. Dudes I mean, who've never, yeah, right. Like, no track record. Nothing yeah. we could point. No, not not today. You or I could probably go raise money, but boy. Uh, then there's nothing, yeah, right? Nobody I, I have a saying: there's no such thing as easy money. Yeah, I, I right. know you. Know, you probably meet the same guys. I meet CEOs who entrepreneurs say, "Yeah, I never spend more than a week raising oh. you know, money," and they're like, "Well, it was never like that for me." No, mm. me neither. Yeah, yeah it's. Yeah. it's hard. I have a lot of skills. It's, that turns out to not be one of them. It's hard. <laughs> it's, it is it's, it's really hard. hard. Yeah. Super hard. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, so how did, how did that go after the, how did that, how, how far did that $750,000 take you? Yeah, well, it didn't take us very far. So, <laughs> no. um, so we had a very aggressive plan and our plan was to have Peter buy our company. So what, what we wanted, <laughs> Which I, I knew nothing about this plan, of what, course. What we wanted to do was we wanted to make a series of trading card games that were loosely using the same model that Legend of the Five Rings used. They were factionalized. They would have stories. So we, we kind of thought we'd solved for, for that CCG segment, right? We could replicate it. So the idea was we're going to make a bunch of these games really quickly. We're going to grow them all to be about the same size as L5R. We're going to be such an attractive acquisition target that Wizards is just going to say, we have to, you know, we have to have you. It's and so weird to hear <laughs> <laughs> that, that our strategy, <laughs> to hear my name attached to another company's That's strategy right. like that. It's well, so, look, so it's so much bizarre. better to, to have me say, and we wanted you to buy us rather than me to be saying, and we figured out a way to screw wizards and we were going to buy them. <laughs> right, yeah. we, it was not that way. Right. Um, right. So, uh, so, Bob, uh, um, so Bob famously told John and I, I'm going to run this company at the cliff as fast as I can. <gasps> And your job is to figure out how to build wings before we die. <laughs> like, he was super aggressive and right. wanted to move very quickly. Mm. And that right. was the right strategy, right? I mean, I think given that yeah. time and that environment. And so we just put the pedal down and ran at that cliff. Right. Meanwhile, John and I are, you know, trying to right. make stuff happen. So I was responsible for the product design. So I had all these teams building games. John was doing sales and marketing. So he was traveling right. the country, talking to distributors and retailers. And every day that, you know, that cliff got closer and closer. And um, we went to the Gamma Trade Show in 1996, which was in Reno. Okay. And that was a bad year for the gaming industry. A lot of small publishers had failed or were failing. Mm -hmm. And this weird thing happened. TSR, which had not missed a print deadline, they hadn't failed to produce a product on time in a long time. They were famous for hitting schedules. They were like, mm -hmm. a, they, were, they were well known for They that. were yeah. a clock. They missed a bunch of print deadlines. And there were people at that show walking around with black armbands to, you know, commiserate about the death of the gaming industry. Oh. Um, <laughs> And that was, I think, when people really got their inkling that there was a real problem. Like, hmm. TSR was not a healthy company at that so, point. So, TSR, publishers of Dungeons & Dragons. Yep. Uh, obvious to most people, but you never know. Um, so, right. how, how, <laughs> how, does this link, how does this lead from disa near disaster, pending disaster, That's right. to opportunity? Hmm. Well, as you know, Peter, sometimes in business, when you're about to fail, the best strategy is to try to get even bigger. So, <laughs> yes. so yes. Bob's idea was, uh, well, if TSR is, has some kind of problem, then they need help. Right. And the idea of packaging TSR and Five Rings Publishing together and selling that as a new deal in the Seattle investment community wasn't that bad an idea. We right. could take our company, which was worth X, and say, well, now it's worth you know, 10X, mm. right? <laughs> uh, because we've created this opportunity right. to buy yeah. this really valuable asset. When you pitch it to Peter, obviously. Yeah. That, well, that, <laughs> Peter that, has no idea. But we're, that's coming very soon. Mm. Um, and, and clearly that was in the back of our minds from the beginning. Mm. Uh, right. Peter has, has been in the role-playing game milieu for his whole you know, creative life. Mm. Um, and Wizards of the Coast at the time was the most successful company in hobby gaming. And uh, it, was, it didn't take a brain surgeon to figure out there would be synergy. Right. Mm. Yeah, obviously. Well, and um, I think I was probably known, you guys knew 
that I love D and D. That's right. Yes, mm. and you know, I, I've I've heard in the past, although I don't think we've ever talked about this, that that there were people at TSR who felt like Wizards was kind of a usurper, that respect should be paid, that like you guys had kind of come out of nowhere and had gone from zero to hero, and that TSR was the you know the power of the industry, the most important company, and how dare these upstarts in Seattle, you know, sell more than they right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, I mean, and yeah. we know, uh, you know, from analysis that actually Games Workshop had become yeah. bigger than TSR right. Hmm. before right. Wizards became bigger than Games Workshop or TSR. Right. So really, they should have been angry at Games Workshop, not <laughs> not at Wizards. Yeah, but they're they're British. <laughs> That's right. It's invisible. <laughs> it's in England. It was invisible. Yeah. 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 Well, that kind of brings us full circle. Bob had this weird... And that's the bizarre thing. Right. It's like, you didn't hire Bob because he is no. connected to... T had some Nothing. history with TSR and no. worked there. No. I mean, that wasn't... You guys weren't thinking about no, that, right? No, not the slightest. We had, just, well, when we did... He was the, just the money guy in Seattle. That's right. When we yeah. put the yeah. Fire Rings Publishing deal together, TSR, as far as we knew, was perfectly healthy. Yeah. Right. There wasn't any... Right. There wasn't even an inkling right. they were having a problem. Right. Um, right. So, yeah. So, lottery ticket comes good. Turns out Bob has the ability to pick up the phone and call Lake Geneva, right. get Lorraine on the phone, get the right. owner of TSR on the phone, and say, I, I want to come see you. And right. then we did. And and what we found there was okay, mind-blowing. Okay. okay, okay. So so let's let's, let's dive in. Take yeah. us through it, oh, step gosh. by step. Yeah. We don't want to miss any, any second of this. The nitty-gritty, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, well, the surface level was that TSR had... Um, had successfully navigated a number of challenges in the 80s and the 90s, right. and that they outwardly appeared to be very successful. They had they had kind of mastered the art of publishing novels. They had their successful you know role playing game line. Um, they had been pretty successful at going into the trading card game business. They made Spellfire and a few and the Blood Wars and something else I'm probably forgetting. So if you didn't know anything else about it, you would think they were doing great, right? Well. When we got in there and, and got under the hood, what we discovered was that they had not been doing great for a number of years prior to the, the iceberg becoming visible. Mm. They had a very unique deal with Random House. And their deal was that they could ship Random House anything. And Random and, House would pay them. And Random House was their distributor into the book trade, that's right? right. Hmm. B. Dalton, Waldron that's right. Books, that's right. back when books were sold in that's right. stores. That's right. And, yeah. and the book yeah. trade business yeah. was a really big business. It was like, yeah, there, there were of, thousands third of, of their business, stores. right? That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Every mall in America had a B. Dalton and usually had a B. Dalton and something else. Right. Um, and then the big, uh, like the Barnes and Nobles, uh, they came along. Walden Books was everywhere. There was a right. big business of books in like airports, and it was a huge. Yeah. business. and you know, all those books had Dungeons and Dragons. All those stores had Dungeons and Dragons. That's right. That's right. And they had the novels. And the, TSR and the novels. was really good at publishing novels, and a lot of those novels made the New York Times bestseller list. Wow. So, so they, so Random House had this deal with TSR. TSR could basically ship them anything, and then Random House would pay them, and Random House would distribute that product to the bookstores and the understanding was that if it didn't sell eventually there would be a return and then there would be an accounting like some credits would be issued something well the book business at the time and some people would probably argue still today is kind of archaic and not really nimble and they don't pay attention to a lot of things they probably should have and Random House kind of let it get away with them and they had TSR had racked up of enormous um, liability that had never really been right been accounted for, right? right? Mm. Um, and eventually, Random House discovered that and came down on TSR with you know both feet and a ton of bricks. And this was at the end of '96. Yeah, think that happened, in that time right? frame. It, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So suddenly, TSR is being told by their biggest distributor, right? We want you to pay us a lot of money, millions and millions of dollars, right? Along the way, as their business had kind of been decaying, they had made a bunch of other deals. They sold their building and then leased it back. They had uh, sold their warehouse and then leased it back. They had made a deal with a printer that was the ex became the exclusive printer for TSR. So they couldn't shop their print jobs around to try to get a better deal. They were locked into this kind of long-term deal. And they owed money to all of these people that they didn't have. And, right. and they, couldn't, they couldn't have, they didn't have the money. Uh, and, and they had taken out a very sizable loan from a bank and that loan was uh, was guaranteed with the copyrights to a number of the key D&D &D right. IP. Oh. 
And they had also used other parts of the D&D IP to secure loans, lines of credit, and some of their uh, foreign distribution deals. So one of the things that we found is that if TSR had been forced into bankruptcy, in a bankruptcy court, those creditors would have claimed those copyrights and trademarks. Oh. And it wouldn't have been like one company had it all. It would have been some over here and some over here and some over here. And so putting that egg back together again after it had been scrambled would have been really hard. Yeah. Like hard to the point where it might not have been possible to publish Dungeons and Dragons without right. years of litigation yep. and deal making. And, and of course, all of these people probably would believe that they had the best part of it. And so they would want a premium price. Right. Mm -hmm. These are the things that happen sometimes in a complicated financial meltdown. Right. Yeah. Right. Things get scattered and then it's tough to get them back together again, right? Right. Well, there was one way to fix this problem. And the answer to that question is Peter Ackerson. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the fixer. The fixer. So uh, we came back. But from you tried before you called me. You tried to raise the money. You oh, Bob, yeah. Bob tried to raise the money locally. Yeah, I'm too. sure Bob called around. I mean, at some point the idea came yeah. that, to, that you guys were going to buy TSR. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, Bob is, um, you know, Bob is a, like an aggressive guy who's always, you know, moving and shaking and making stuff happen. Right. He would love to have purchased right. TSR. Right. Sure. Mm -hmm. sure. If, if he could have found, you know, a couple of Microsoft millionaires to. <laughs> Right. To put together a package, he would have happily. Right. But right. I mean, I don't think that lasted long. Right. Partly because TSR was in such disarray, like they needed help fast. fast. Mm. Right. And we were not in good shape either, right. because we had been running at the cliff and preparing to throw ourselves off <laughs> and hope we invented wings. <laughs> and um, so we we were in this weird position at Five Rings Publishing. We had succeeded with Legend of the Five Rings in an, in a market where most trading card games were failing. And we needed to print more of it. And we had a bunch of games that were coming down our production pipeline that we thought were going to be successful, and we needed to print more. And our cash flow at the time was not sufficient to allow us to print all the stuff that we wanted to print. So after Bob had kind of circulated uh, you know, around the local community and kind of realized that that was going to be a longer, more difficult pitch than right. maybe otherwise, um, he, f he famously called Peter and said, I need to borrow a million dollars. <gasps> and Peter said, I love you, Bob, but that can't happen. And Bob said, I'm going to send you a fax, and then you're going to call me back, and we're going to talk about it. And the fax that Bob sent Peter was basically the cover letter of our letter of intent to buy TSR. And Peter called back and said, let's talk. <laughs> and uh, it was at that point, I think, when the momentum of the deal changed in ways that I don't think anybody at TSR really understood, because you guys definitely had the financial horsepower to do a deal. By far, you had the, the horsepower, but you also, but you personally were passionate about yeah. Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. It right. wasn't like going to Hasbro or Mattel, or like it wasn't some clinical right. business deal. It was a thing you cared about, right? Um, and 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 I mean, your your shareholders and your board were behind you. It wasn't like you were some you know out there in the wilderness. Well, it wasn't. Uh, I mean, it wasn't like it was. I didn't have to yeah. pitch it and sell it. I mean, I, right. I had to go to the board, and, yeah. and yeah. if it wouldn't have been for, I mean, that's another story. But if it wouldn't have been for Richard Garfield saying, "Yeah, I, I think we should do this," yeah. he was, the, you know, and he was the, on the board, and um, and also Vince yep. said, "Well, I don't know this game business, but." Peter does, and yep. he likes this, you know. Yep. Um, so yeah, it was um, the yeah. board. The board supported it. Uh, yeah. The biggest thing I had to fight was, why not just let this thing go into bankruptcy right. and buy it pennies on the dollar? That's right. Mm. Right. That's As right. opposed to paying, because uh, the deal that eventually came involved us paying everybody off. Yeah. Mm. Which, That's right. Which in a typical bankruptcy you'd you would never it, do. You get it for you know yeah a quarter of that or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was definitely a kind of a touch-and-go situation. And then, you know, we had, part of our deal with Lorraine was, we were actually not supposed to shop this deal. We weren't right. supposed to tell anybody. Right. Hmm. Right. So, this gets us back to what you were talking about before with, you know, this kind of tension between TSR and Wizards of the Coast. There was a very delicate moment where Bob had to go into a room with Lorraine and be like, I need to tell you, Lorraine, that Peter Ackeson is going to be the funding source. And, right. you know, and I wasn't in that room, which is weird because I usually was, but that room I was not in. But, you know, Bob is a very persuasive guy, and he I, made it happen. He was probably the perfect person to have he that conversation with her. Yeah. 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 He was, he's like a specialized tool. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I remember I had a, I remember the conversation I had with you when I said, well, um, you know, uh, if I'm going to 
finance buying TSR, then I want to buy TSR. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I'm not going to yeah. be a shareholder in yeah. your company. No yeah, offense, right, Ryan, right. but I'm not going to be a shareholder <laughs> in your company, and you're going to run TSR. Yeah, not, not TSR right. is going to move to Renton. That's right. And and be in the hollowed hall, halls of Wizards of the Coast. That's right. right? That's right. Yeah. So that, that then, it, then it became a, a roll-up. It was, you know, buy TSR and buy Five Weeks Publishing, because we had the right to buy TSR. Right. So that was... Yep. Mm-hmm. That was um, it was kind of a twofer. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and I'll be honest. I mean, frankly, I was perfectly happy with that outcome. <laughs> like, I'd always wanted to work at Wizards of the Coast, and we yeah. were coming in as winners, so you know, no <laughs> hard was, done, right? It was kind of an aqua hire in a way. right? It was an aqua hire, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> right. and it, and it was a good aqua hire. Like everybody at Fire Publishing was happy to be a part of the Wizards family, and I think after some initial bumps, most of the people at Wizards were happy that they had ended up with us. Like, yeah. we did no harm. We made we made money worth the cost of our acquisition. It was okay. Well, and I remember, you know, having a conversation with, uh, I think it was Jeff Christensen, probably. Probably. About, you know, what is the, you know, we're going to pay these guys a lot of money. I'm not sure that, <laughs> yeah, that would be a the amount of money they're going to have get out of this is really, <laughs> yeah. you know, in Jeff's like there, you would, in other deals, you'd pay an agent, that kind yeah, of Yeah, that's money, right. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, mm. You know, you'd pay an agent. Ten yeah, percent, ten percent, or something, or something yeah. like that. Just think yeah. of it. That makes you feel better, Peter. Just think of it that way. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. So we we uh, we so we, so we did the deal. We hired you. Yep. As uh, we did the deal with Lorraine. Yep. Bought TSR. Yep. Um, there obviously I'm you know glossing over what right. was the three, hard part. The three yeah, yeah the, the yeah. three month process yeah, that's of right. going out and doing <laughs> a lot of diligence, lot of late night phone calls, a lot of meeting people, a lot of awkward meetings, flights to Lake Geneva, yeah, flights to Lake Geneva, yeah. um, going through you know I remember the you know the stacks of paperwork we had to sign for the oh, deal, yeah. um, and we hired you yep. to be the brand manager for TSR Dungeons and Dragons. Kind yeah, of so I, I came to Wizards and I worked in a group called New Brand Development and Licensing with Rich Fukutaki, and that's where we put that's where Wizards put the Five Rings Publishing business. And I I was it was essentially a transition position at the beginning because I was managing those businesses and in order to retain the value that Wizards just paid for it would have been foolish right. to take me out of there. Um, and I remember vividly you came to my office one day and you said I'm going to ask the board to put you in charge of the D&D business if you want to do it. And I was like, yeah, I totally want to do it. Like, right. Absolutely. Um, I was telling you the other day that I, when I was a kid, I told people, and I'm like 10 or 11 years old, I told people I was going to grow up to publish Dungeons and Dragons. Oh my gosh. (laughs) I mean, I had, I made my own modules. Yeah. Like, it was the thing, right? Mm. And then, and then it actually happened, which is (laughs) crazy. Yeah. But I could have easily gone into Wizards and worked in NBA DNL and made uh, trading card games. And this, the original structure that Peter had set up during the transition could have managed the D&D business and I would have just been an, a part of Wizards but not a part of D&D. Mm. But eventually, I, you know, you, you dubbed well, the you... Sir Ryan and put me in the seat. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, it, it's a unique business, Yeah. first of all, and you'd studied it. Yeah. Um, you'd studied it as someone who wanted to buy it. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. You'd studied, you'd analyzed it as the type of and the type of analysis you'd want a business manager to do, yeah. and you knew what the problems were. Yeah. I mean, we of course we were confident that this business had value, yeah. but it was heavily in debt. So, yeah. okay, well, write a bunch of checks and get the debt off the books, right. and then finance operations. How do we really make this into? A company, and um, yeah. I felt you had the right vision for that. So why, why don't you describe what that vision was? So we had a meeting uh, shortly after you asked me to take that position on, which uh, I called the Dirty Diaper meeting, and um, <laughs> that was a meeting that Vince chaired, and it was uh, it was me and some of the financial analysis people, and uh, and Bill Slavisek was there. Uh, and Rick Aarons was there. Rick, now, Bill Slavisek was one of the senior guys at TSR. That's right. Mm. Essentially became the head of the RPG design it, it group. Became head of, yep. Yeah. Yep. Rick Aarons was uh, uh, hired in at, uh, as a business management at one point, and then he kind of took over and did a bunch of other cool stuff. Yeah, by then, Rick was running organized play for yep. Magic the Gathering, and yep. now he's a, you know, he's Pokemon runs company. Pokemon USA. Yep. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so the Dirty Diaper meeting was um, every part of this business is losing money. It's all broken. Uh, <laughs> revenues are down across the line. Costs are up across the line. Uh, it's cost of living in Seattle area much higher than Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. We just moved a bunch of folks out. Yep. Uh, 
you know, partners are wondering what it is we're doing with this business. Industry is wondering what we're doing with this business. You know, are role playing games even relevant anymore? Right. Um, and uh, and we kind of rolled up our sleeves and said, yeah, we can we can fix this. Like, this is oh, this business is fundamentally sound. It has an amazing brand, right? Great products. It has a twenty five year. It was the silver anniversary twenty five year legacy of customers and products people are familiar with. We had strong video game licensing. We just talked about that earlier a little bit about the relationships that had kind of been come into existence slightly before the deal, but Wizards of the Coast was managing them. So our goal was streamline the company, streamline the parts of TSR that Wizards had acquired to focus on the parts that were profitable. And that meant focusing on Dungeons and Dragons. Wizards had acquired a company that was publishing the Dungeons and Dragons role-playing game, the Alternative role-playing game, the Saga system, the Marvel superheroes game. I think there were probably two or three other things in there somewhere. Right, right. All of which had were surrounded by a penumbra of accessories, expansions, adventure right. content. Right. Um, and we were basically offering to the role player, you know, a, a smorgasbord of choices. And there was something in every one of those choices that people liked, and so they were dividing their dollars and their playtime across this incredibly diffuse right. offering. Yeah. And that's bad in role-playing games because the most important thing about a role-playing game is having a group to play with. Hmm. And, and if you have five different people, all of who want to play a different game, it's really hard to get everybody to agree on what we're going to play when we gather for our game night, right? Yeah. So my business team, I was blessed to have a, a mixed group of people who had come from TSR and people who had already been at Wizards of the Coast that we kind of synergized together. We did a great. Is it fair to say Lisa was. Lisa oh, Steve, absolutely. Lisa yeah. Stevens was on your team. One hundred percent. Yeah. Keith Strom. Yep. Was on your team. Yep. Uh, Dave Wise, Jim Butler, uh, Cindy Rice. Um, yeah. Uh, good. Good. Uh, good Anthony cast. Volterra, yeah. Uh, Leeds Chamberlain was kind of our office manager. Um, yeah. We had a. Yeah. We had a. Yeah. And that was just my business management team. Right. So one of the things that happened relatively early on was that that Bill had become Bill Slavisek had become the head of RPG R and D. Right. And he and I made an agreement, and the agreement was that my team would not interfere in creative decisions, and his team would not interfere in business decisions. And that if we had, if my team had a problem with a creative issue, or if his team had a problem with a business issue, that he and I would resolve that issue together. Hmm. And I will say, Bill is one of the best partners that I've ever had in a business. Like well, that's great. We had a super open and honest relationship. That's awesome. Um, I don't and, think he liked me much. <laughs> You know, I, I, I don't think that's true. I mean, oh, Bill's, Bill's a hard guy to read. And I, well, I'm sure we'll get into some of the, the third edition development uh, issues, which there were, there were passions and, 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 and you know, interested, yeah. Yeah. interest and tempers in that. But right. no, I, I, think, I think Bill has nothing so, but... So, so you came up with this vision for like, let's really focus on D&D. &D. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because just last week, Jonathan Tweet was on the show. And uh, I, I think it was probably shortly after that that he came in and pitched doing a Gamma oh, yeah. World. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. he, he said Ryan dashed my plans yeah. of doing yeah. Gamma yeah. World, but then he said, "But it was a good." He agreed with the decision yeah. later. Yeah, I, I, you know, and it, it was one of those things where if we we the business was broken, so it's really hard to change large established institutional entities like mm -hmm. the role playing game business at TSR. It's really hard, and about the only time you can make change is when there has been a massive radical dysfunction. Mm. Right. So the business was so broken that we were free to do heretical things like not publish a, a, su a successful role-playing game like Alternity, mm -hmm. or to not accept a proposal from a successful designer like Jonathan Tweet. Right. Uh, and Jonathan wasn't the only one. Chris Pramus had ideas he wanted to do. Rich Baker had ideas they wanted to do. There was, there was plenty of ideas, yeah. right? And, 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 and none of those were bad. They just were bad for that business at that time mm -hmm. under those conditions. Right. So we had a thing we called the Nifty 50, which was the 50 <laughs> best-selling SKUs in the TSR uh, catalog. And they were right. all core D&D SKUs, except for a couple of Forgotten Realms things, and I think two Greyhawk SKUs, and then the two Alternative books, the two Alternative core books. And, and that, we, we rebuilt the business of second edition around the Nifty 50. And we were able to get that part of the business profitable relatively quickly. One of the ways we did that was we stopped making a bunch of things that turned out were not making any money. <laughs> so there was this thing at TSR where the creative people 
were kind of left to their own devices. And the financial people never really talked about any of the business of right. TSR with the creative people. Hmm. And and Lorraine and the, and, the, and the executives at TSR, they were always pushing the creative people like, do cooler things, do, you know, let's try something amazing. So they were producing a campaign setting called Planescape. Right. And Planescape was beautifully produced. Yep. It used a special printing technique. So the paper, the, the pages of the books had like uh, metallic inks on them, um, a lot of full color maps and arts and inserts. Especially for its time, oh, which yeah. was mm. 95 Absolutely or something beautiful. like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Braum, Braum did the art. Yeah, a lot of yeah. that stuff. Right. I mean, this all happened before the acquisition. That's but, right. But mm. kind of recently to the acquisition. Yeah, that's right. 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 And that game, that game lost, I think, $3.00. Every time we sold a copy of it, what? The, the core box, like so, huh. like it's a pretty easy to say. Just don't make that anymore. <laughs> like right. we need, you know, we need to fix this business. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just stop yeah. making the things that are losing money. Um, but you know, every time you do that, there's a plus and a minus. So there were people who loved that yeah. campaign setting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I was going to ask. Uh, like, it's obviously a very good business decision, but was yeah. there any? feedback from yeah. the fans, from the people? What was the reaction yeah. when you started doing this? <laughs> well, moral outrage. <laughs> yeah. You know, the interesting thing is, is that TSR did not have a market research function that worked. They didn't know very much about their own customers. Mm. And they had some very weird policies about the use of the internet and interaction with people on the internet. So they were kind of deaf, right? And that carried over to Wizards of the Coast. Wizards did have a pretty good market research hmm. capability, and it did listen to its customers. But we were taking in that TSR system. And so until it, all the pieces were kind of connected, we were a little bit operating in the dark. But the stakeholders inside the company had very strong opinions. <laughs> and and a, lot, look, a lot of these people, if you imagine that you worked at a company like TSR, like you got your job, you're going to work in the role-playing game business at TSR. Right, it's right. like you know being hired to work on an Avengers movie. Yeah. Right. If, you're, if you're a comic book fan, it, that's the, like, and you get to TSR, and, you have, and then you get into a long queue of people who all have amazing ideas, and yours is one of the ideas that gets selected to become a campaign setting. Right. Like, you, it's epic. And then some dude comes in and says, nah, we're not going to make it anymore. It costs us three bucks a box. We're just uh, done with it. Like, yeah. it has got to yeah. be mm. one of the most difficult things to, as a yeah. creative person yeah. Right. To, yeah. To, right. to, to suffer through. Like, it, it, and, and it's coming from outsiders, effectively. Yeah, outsiders, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, they, they didn't, people yeah. they didn't know. And anyway, right. yeah. and, and, and I will say, like, if, if, you, if you could take Ryan and move back in time, the farther back in time you go, the more of an asshole I become. So, <laughs> like, I was young, and I was very arrogant, and I, I was a difficult person to be around, mm. and they had to put up with that. But, okay, so, yes, there was, there were definitely, there, were, there was pushback. But at the end of the day, look, we had a job to do. That was to make that business function. And in order to become successful and go into the future and do cool stuff, we had to stop that bleeding. And, and I think yep. we did, right? Yep. We did stop yep. that bleeding. Yep. 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 And then the next thing was, following easily from the idea of focusing on D&D, we have to make the next edition of Dungeons & Dragons. Right. And that edition of Dungeons & Dragons has to be the centerpiece of the renaissance of the role-playing game business at Wizards of the Coast. Like, that mm. must work. We can't say, right. well, we'll do third edition of D&D, and if that doesn't work, well, then we'll try this other thing, and then we'll try... It was all in. Mm. Like, it was third edition or bust. It just right. had to work, right? Um, and, and I mean, that kind of takes us up to your involvement in the design team and documents circulating and debates about direction. And <laughs> well, I remember I had to come in at one point and tell you, okay, Ryan, and I think I did it. You can verify this as true or not, or if it's just my memory, but I think it's at the time I gave you the job. Yep. I said, listen, you want to run D&D? Great. I got to tell you up front, I'm running, th I'm running yep. the design of third edition. Yep, yep. 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 Uh, so you're run D and D, but yep. this very important part. I want all these designers reporting directly to me, yep. and we're going to work on on yep. that. So it had to have been a little nerve wracking to be in charge of this business, realizing what you just said about how important third edition would be, yep. and not having any authority. And Bill Slavisek not really having any yep. authority. Neither one of you yep. having real authority over yep. it. Right. Um, all those guys technically reported to Bill, yep. but in the context of the design group, yep. they reported to me. And you know, down the hall was Mary Kirchhoff, who's running the book business, which also had the magazine business. Right. And she's a strong-willed, independent woman, and she wasn't real interested in having me be her boss, and I wasn't her boss. Right. Um, so, and the book business was critical to D&D, so that had to be managed. Um, and then the convention business was being run by Susan Scheid, mm -hmm. and that was Gen Con. 
And, yep. you know, major decisions are being made about moving that to Indianapolis. Um, so, yeah. So, like, <laughs> I had to be, my role in all of this was to be um, the person who figured out how to make a strategy and then other people to follow that strategy, as opposed to telling people, this is what the strategy is and you must obey. Mm. Like, it was, I had to be very diplomatic and I had to figure out who needed to approve what and you know, like how far could I push certain things? And I mean, there was probably certain areas of my authority that I never tested. Like there were things I probably could have done that I, I felt like if I did them, it would be catastrophically bad. I mean, there's certainly some things with Gen Con, for example, I caught, probably could have gone in and banged my fist on the table and who knows what would have happened. And with Dragon Magazine, I remember vividly, we had a conversation at one point, uh, an issue of Dragon Magazine had come out and there was a piece of cover art on it. And you know, for its time, Wizards of the Coast was very progressive in its depiction of women and uh, non-white characters. Like, you set the tone, mm. then that was throughout the whole company. Like, we are not, we're going to break free of these old... Well, and you can't credit me for that without me turning around and crediting Beverly, of course. Beverly uh, of course. Sailing. Yes. Uh, she, yeah. she really is the one who taught yeah. me all yeah. that. Yeah. So a piece of cover art came across, uh, uh, came across, and it made its way into a executive meeting, one of the Monday morning meetings, and... I think either you or Vince turned to me and said, why did you let that happen? And I was like, <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't exactly have control of that, uh, but I probably could have. Like, I could have. I could have. Well, I'm I'd suddenly curious what that art was. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't that bad, but it wasn't what I would. It I don't wasn't. think you or I would look at it today and think it was acceptable. Hmm. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. It was a little cheesecakey. Yeah. All yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and then... Um, and then we, we had confidence in your third edition development group because we were in that loop. We were getting the playtest materials. We were participating in the play. And when I say we, I mean my whole business team. Right. Everybody was in, engaged. Sure, um, sure, sure. So it wasn't like it was being and, done off-site in a black box. And, and the Watsi R&D people, the Magic R&D people, mm. you know, people like Scaff and Andrew Finch. I was playing with those guys. That's right. And it was being tested throughout the company. That's pretty, right. I mean, it was a project that captured the imaginations yeah. of everybody. That's I mean, right. everybody, everybody felt cool. Like, yeah. wow, we have Dungeons and Dragons yeah. and we have this opportunity. Yeah. And there was this balance of, yeah, we've, you know, of how do we apply our particular part of this and how do we respect the tradition and everybody is coming with it and, and get everybody to work together it was yeah. very tricky. I mean, it was, I think it was particularly easy for me in that I think your objective design aesthetic matched very closely with what I would have wanted to do anyway. I never ever felt like you and I were at loggerheads on anything involving yeah. the design yeah. ever. Mm. So yeah. like you wanted to do something and, and, you would, and I would be like, well, of course, like that. Yes, yeah. just do that, like, <laughs> that's right. fine. Yeah. Um, and, and you know that in the lead up to when you kind of reorganized that team, some of the work on third edition that had been done at Wizard at TSR prior to the acquisition was not that. They had had some ideas of being more radical. And there were some ideas that were not what I would consider to be kind of mainstream D&D &D, um, design. They, they had been working on D&D &D for a long time and, and they were interested in stretching and, and trying new things. And... Um, and that, that was part of the tension with the TSR people on the, on the third edition team was how do we navigate this desire to creatively challenge ourselves with Peter's desire to make uh, the best version of D&D? &D? Hmm. Like, yeah. 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 So, and fair to say uh, you were happy with the results, D&D. &D. Yeah, I mean. D&D &D uh, was sold awesome. well. Yeah, right. I mean, uh, you know, Vince... Um, yeah, Vince. Uh, Vince Glory, who was Vince Kalori, my number was, two, yeah, and he was, was on the show uh, last exactly. year. Yeah. He, uh, he, he very publicly, <laughs> I'm trying not to use the expletives we were talking about before. <laughs> he, his, his commandment to me was, you know, figure out what went wrong, fix it, and don't bleep it up. Right. Like that. <laughs> one of the nice things about Vince is very clear direction. Very clear um, direction, yeah. yeah. And so... Uh, and so we, we got ourselves in a position where we had stabilized the company. We had a very good team. We had a very good expanded team, all the people that were, all the stakeholders were working on it. The third edition team was moving ahead in a direction that was virtually guaranteed to produce the product that we needed when we needed it. And that was when we started talking about the open gaming license. Yeah. 
that was good. the good transition. I was just about ready to send you <laughs> send you in that because uh, no. yeah, yeah. Where we're at on the clock, I I, I want to spend some time on the OGL because yeah. that you know that yeah. It was a big, crazy, crazy talk. <laughs> I mean, it's a big move. So remind, let's remind everybody what life was like before OGL yeah. and what OGL yeah. meant and did. So open, open gaming license. The, the operating legal theory in the in the role playing game business, which may or may not be true, is that you cannot publish a game that is compatible with somebody else's role playing game system without a license. And that theory was used to box every game into a little silo. The publisher and a select group of licensors could make content for that game and nobody else. And so the gaming industry was filled with these silos. There was a White Wolf silo and a FASA silo and a Steve Jackson silo and a TSR silo. And as the total number of people that were playing role-playing games was shrinking, those silos were segmenting the audience into groups of people that were becoming disconnected. And that was causing gaming groups to break down, and that was causing a feedback loop where the whole role-playing business was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So we were looking around for models of ways to kind of break free of that. Uh, Wizards had had a pioneering effort in that direction very early on, back in the Primal Order days, mm -hmm. uh, called uh, Paragon? Envoy. And, Envoy, oh. yes. Well, and Primal Order itself, to be fair. That's right, right which yeah. was a cap system, we, a game that was we, designed to be used with many... Yes. Right? Yes. Um, and, and we got sued for it. And we got sued. Yes. <laughs> There's a gold sticker on the back of my copy of Primal Order. Yes. Yes. Anyway. Yes. It was compatible with 20 different R's. That's RP, right. You know, yeah, every, Merps, uh, yep. you know, Rollmaster, yep. Ars Magica, yep. all sorts of systems. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, so, okay. So, our thought was, we're lucky what we, if? We're lucky we only got sued once. That's, <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly, right? Right? Oh, God. Anyway, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, so our thought was, what if we created an environment where anybody who wanted to could make content for the new edition of Dungeons and Dragons? Right. But we just wouldn't let them call what they were making Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> like we would be the people who publish Dungeons and Dragons, but other people could publish content that was compatible with Dungeons and Dragons. Well, we know that if we said, oh, we're going to have this thing where you can say you're compatible with Dungeons and Dragons, that it would say compatible with Dungeons and Dragons, right? Mm -hmm. it would be, the obvious thing would be to confuse people about how the trademark yeah. worked. So in addition to the idea of the open gaming license, which was the legal mechanism to let people make stuff compatible. And I just want to emphasize, before this, you couldn't publish you could not. Dungeons and Dragons material. You would be sued. There, yeah. yeah, there were people that kind of skirted the edges, yeah. like Judges Guild That's stuff right. and so yeah. on. But, the role but the, basically, you, yeah. you couldn't do it. Yeah, you certainly couldn't raise money to do it because yeah. no investor would accept right. the risk that right. you would vanish right. in a puff of litigation, right? Right. Um, so we created a intermediate brand, the D20 system trademark. D20. And we put the D20 system trademark on all the D&D books, and then we created a license that let publishers use the D20 system trademark on their products. And that created a linkage so that we didn't have to tell let people say they were using the Dungeons & Dragons trademark. Hmm. They could use this D20 system trademark. Well. Okay. And, and they wouldn't have to apply. They could that's just right. do it. They could right. just we, do we, it. we couldn't tell them no. No, that's And they right. wouldn't have to pay you. There and they no would, there's no royalties. Hmm. Yeah. And et cetera. That's right. right. And I think there's no a approvals. version of this is still around, right? Is oh, yeah. It, yeah. 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 People publish under all the, that's yeah. Pathfinder's yeah. published under that. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. So, right. So, we knew going into the transition from second to third edition that our biggest competitor was Dungeons & Dragons. It was this huge library of second edition content and the older library of first edition content. And there was no way that our team at Wizards could possibly make, replicate all of that content in any kind of rational time frame, right? So if you were a person who really wanted to play a snake-headed ninja from, uh, you know, a space world, <laughs> we weren't going to get to you anytime soon, right? <laughs> but if we uncorked the world to all those other publishers, somebody out there who had a bee in their bonnet to make, you know, snake-headed ninjas, they could produce it, that is, content, is this, right? Uh, let's see, is this... Chris Pramus? Oh, no, I don't, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not. I'm just making stuff up. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, right. So, um, yeah. So, essentially what we did was we, we thought, well, we're going to make the most valuable parts of, of right. the business, the nifty 50. We're going to make the player's handbooks and dungeon master's guides and monster manuals. We're going to make the Forgotten Realms core books. But just, like, we're going to focus on just the stuff that we know is going to sell really well. Okay. And we're going to let the creative genius of the world fill in all the rest of the stuff and they're going to do it 
we thought relatively quickly because like they've never they've never been allowed to do it before their the <laughs> desire is built up over right. 25 right. years of yeah. you know creativity right. in, in a bottle and sure enough it totally worked like that <laughs> stuff just came out of everywhere it was awesome like Wolf jumped on it. Oh yeah, oh, I was Chris so... Prama started his own company. Yeah, to right. Do it. Completely mm. spun off into uh, do uh, Green Ronin. Yeah. Yeah. I I got an advanced copy of the first Creature Collection book, which was a collaboration between a company called uh, Necromancer Studios, which was run by Clark Peterson, and White Wolf, which was run by Steve Wick and uh, Mike Tinney and and Steve's brother. And they sent me a copy of this book, and I walked around the Wizards of the Coast. I was like a father. Like, I wanted to hand out cigars. Like, <laughs> White Wolf is publishing a D20 book. Like, mm. how can anybody in this industry think that we're going to screw them if White Wolf is going to do it? Like, right. it, was, it was like a stamp of approval, right? Mm. And, we were, and then we were off to the races. And it totally worked. Like, we sold... The best part of the D&D business, the, the books that sold the most units, that's what Wizards of the Coast sold. Right. And we had the opportunity to look at all this cool stuff that was being created. And if we had chosen to, we could pick the pieces of that out and put that into D&D if we wanted to. Because those rights were available to us as well as they were available to the rest of the world. Like, right. hmm. we could be our, we could use that content. So... The snake ninja could show It up. could happen, yeah. right? Yeah, right. Um, Still holding it, it could be a big. It could be a big feedback loop. Um, and, and then we, I think the next thing that we did that really shocked people was we said, this isn't just for fantasy role playing. We did the Call of Cthulhu game. Right. Um, we did, uh, we did the Star Wars game. Um, like we showed people, you could take these core game mechanics and you could do any kind of game, any kind of genre. And because they were, they were all kind of connected, um, to some very fundamental parts of the game design, they were reasonably compatible. Like they weren't, it wasn't like yeah. 100% compatible, right. but right. it really wasn't that hard. You could take stuff that we published for D&D and put it in a Call of Cthulhu game, a D20 Call of Cthulhu game, and it would basically work, um, which was awesome. And then at the same time, we were experimenting. So the Star Wars game has a, um, a different kind of critical hit system. Um, it has wounds and like, it, it's, it has a more complicated thing about what happens if your character gets damaged, which is probably not appropriate for D&D, but that's one of the first things that designers do in D&D when they start making their own stuff is they make these very complicated, you know, yeah, yeah, how does yeah. my arm get cut off? And <laughs> how do I get a scar? And, mm. Right? Well, you could, if you wanted to, you could just take that part of the D20 Star Wars game and put that in your D&D game and all of a sudden you'd have this really cool I, Yeah, stuff. I, I remember my Star Wars, I play tested in the Star Wars yep. game. Mm. I had an Ewok rogue character yep. class yep. Yep. ewok <laughs> race yep. uh with proficiencies right out of third edition yep. i had two weapon fighting so yep. of course two laser blasts that's right boom, 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 that's boom, right boom. <laughs> it was great it was, yep. it was gross yep. <laughs> now when, when we had told people well we're gonna we're gonna you know we're gonna narrow down our focus to just D and a bunch of these campaign settings are gonna go away and we're gonna whatever okay there was like the roar was like a four right mm. when we told people we were gonna give away Dungeons and Dragons, whoo, I mean, the roar was like a 9.5. Like there yeah. were people who came in the meetings red faced, thinking that literally the world was gonna end, that we were, we were about to make the most colossal business you mean mistake. people at Wizards. Inside yeah. Wizards of the inside Coast. Of, like, oh, not yeah. like a happy roar, like a no. mad roar. Oh, wow, like, okay. What are, you people are insane. We just paid X millions of dollars to buy this property and Ryan wants to just give it away? <laughs> For free with no approvals, I mean. Uh, but you had, to, but I liked the idea. Well, that and, we were and, golden and, because but of that. I mean, but also, <laughs> but I relied on people like Scaff and Richard, who mm. were must have been uh, excited about yeah. it from the very beginning. But, you know, I we mean, someone or Rick Aaron's, he understood network externalities. That's right. right. I, I mean, mean, we we joked all the time about what I called the Scaff effect, which was. If you had the market share leading game in any significant game category and the total amount of activity in that category increased, you would benefit. Mm. Like if more people were doing role playing, Dungeons and Dragons, which was the market share leading game, would benefit, right? Yeah. So there was a business rationale to say, let's just get more activity in this space and let's get that activity in games that are close enough to D&D &D that people's gaming groups don't get yeah. dissolved. Like, right. You could, we can play Call of Cthulhu, and then we'll play the Space Ninja game, and then we'll play D&D, &D, and everybody can kind of follow along, because we're not asking you to start over from scratch and learn a whole new game, and like, uh, and, and like yeah. I say, I mean, it totally it, worked, right? Yeah, it worked. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we had, when we did the first print run of the Player's Handbook for third edition, um, there was a number that the sales team had come back with, 
and that number was too low. And uh, Keith Strom, who was the person who was responsible for the business part of D&D, he increased that number and didn't tell me. And then that number was too low. And I increased that number again, and we didn't tell Peter. <laughs> and we <clears throat> sold that in a month. It was yeah. gone. Yeah. And um, I mean, it was it shocked everybody how how well third edition yeah. was selling because you could compare it to what it, second edition had been selling before we right. released third edition, right. right? Yeah. Yeah. But I had a secret, and the secret was that I had this chart, which I still have, of data that we got from TSR during the due diligence, and I knew what happened in the year that the transition from first edition to second edition had occurred, and it wasn't a percentage increase; it was a multiple. Increase, right? Mm -hmm. And so I and I, I was like, that is going to happen. We're going to get that effect. We're going to go from whatever that second edition number was, twenty thousand copies, to this much bigger number, and then it happened. Like it actually did that, right? Mm -hmm. So, although I feel like the analysis was very good, and my team did an amazing job of pulling all the facts and figures together, and Peter's team did a great job of building the game we needed to have, we were not as far out. In, on the horizon as people might have thought we were. Like yeah, there was yeah. some reasonable basis to the decisions that we were making. Mm. Although from the outside, it looked like it was insane. <laughs> well, also, like you had mentioned, everyone at the company was players, not just excited about it now, but had been playing it for years. Like when yep. you're seeing the splintering of the groups, yeah. you were oh, seeing yeah. that in your own group. We absolutely did. So it was all right in your face. Yep. Everybody that worked on Magic, it started with D&D. &D. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Richard, Loved D and D. Scaff had played D and D. All these guys have played D and D. We yeah. all we all grew up playing D and D, yeah. and D and D influenced Magic: The Gathering, and, yep. and it all yeah. Yep. Um. So looking back now, yeah, <laughs> twenty years later. Yeah, how yeah. long did you stay at Wizards? I left in two. I my last day at Wizards of the Coast, September eleventh, two thousand and one. Oh, hmm. interesting. Yeah. Okay, so you lasted uh, <laughs> a few months longer than I did. Yeah, not much. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I was so, out of the role playing game business that fall. Uh, yeah. Yeah, weirdly. Yeah. Weirdly. Story for another time. So, looking back 18, 19 years ago, yeah. you know, I, I don't know. I, I get goosebumps when I think about those days. Yeah. Like, how, how, do, you, how do you process it? Like, now yeah. that's 20 years later, what, what do you think of when you think back to those days now? Yeah. It, it was the single most fulfilling thing that I've ever done in my entire life. And I did it with a group of people that I love, and, and I was fortunate enough to do it at, at a time and in a company that was supportive of what we wanted to do, and so I didn't, it wasn't traumatic. It was hard, but it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't painful in the mm. sense it can sometimes be, right? Uh, I've never experienced anything like it. I don't think I ever will experience anything like it. Um, and I'm so fortunate to have been given that opportunity, and you know, I just, I'm so thankful that this whole crazy series of coincidences that had to align in just a very specific way did. Yeah. And I got to do that thing and be in that place with those people. And well, it's amazing. I, you say that you, were, you feel so glad that you were given that opportunity. I, I hope you know how glad I feel that you gave me the opportunity <laughs> too. I mean, like, let's, let's be real. It was a huge opportunity for, for me. It was a dream come true. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm glad that um, I was part of your strategic plan. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, really yeah well. and my name was top of That's mind. Right. <laughs> Just to identify the best people available and go work with them. That's the secret. Uh, it was, uh, yeah. uh, what a privilege it was yeah. to, um, to work on that game. Look, I, I yeah. feel like we changed the world in some ways. Like, in, yeah. in, in, that, in this little speck of what we do, right, right. we found the lever and we, we moved the world. And yeah. you just don't get to say that very often. I mean, you've you've had the fortune. You did it with Magic, and you did it with D and D, and you did it with Pokemon. Like you've had that experience multiple times. Like I had the experience well, once. <laughs> well, and you most know, people with, never have. I that mean, experience. with Magic, I feel like I just got lucky. You know, I mean, I sure. met Richard. I mean, okay, I was a nice guy, and Richard, you know, liked me. We got along, and and, and, and you know, he's the one that you know designed it. It was like, wow, just got this gift, you know, uh, and and Pokemon was the same sort of way, you mm. know. Um, but I felt a lot more connected. I felt like D and D, um, and I uh, was like a chance for for me to do something right in the sense yeah. of of like like I was more like yes okay let's go out and get this deal done you know right. let, let's mm. go out and 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 get this by this company yeah and negotiate it and um, uh, convince everybody that was good you yeah. know certainly a lot of people thought we overpaid uh, but it was like your bankruptcy comment earlier. 
we wanted to keep the property intact. Yeah. And that meant not buying it in bankruptcy That's where right. you'd have where we would have paid a quarter of the price. Yeah. It meant paying the full price. Yeah. Yep. But and yeah. uh and, and look, a bunch of the stuff that you did during that acquisition was absolutely to your credit, like restoring Gary and Dave Arneson to the, their proper place. Um, a lot of the artists received art that they didn't ever expect to see again. Mm. Um, I mean, there were a lot of people who were associated with D&D &D who were made whole because Wizards bought the whole thing and didn't try to play games in bankruptcy court. Yeah. yeah. That was, that it was pretty was cool. Good. Good. And can you imagine if D&D had gone away, you know, if just like, if it had ended at that point yeah. and all the I, well, things through all the years. I, I can't imagine it. Yeah, it's yeah. the nightmare scenario. Yeah. yeah, I spent a lot of nights looking at the ceiling thinking if I screw this up, very careful to be family friendly. If I screw this up, like, <laughs> right. it's on me. Like, d, &D yeah. could have died because yeah. of me. You could have killed Dungeons and Dragons. I could have killed Dungeons and Dragons. Like, yeah, yeah. gray hair. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, so, we're almost out of time. Uh, so catch us up. What's happened in the last 18 years? Yeah. What, what, are you, what, what are you doing now? Uh, so I, I work with John again. Uh, You're back with John Zinzer. I know, it's crazy, I, right? I knew that was the answer. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I hope if he watches this, I hope I, I, I love John. Yeah. We, John's, I don't see him John's as much one of the best like. guys in the gaming industry. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm the chief operating officer at Alderac Entertainment Group. Yep. So I'm responsible for all the back office stuff. Um, I also have a role in like uh, filtering and picking new games before we publish them. Uh, and I run our Kickstarter process. So when we put a game on Kickstarter, I'm, I'm behind the scenes making that all work. But I uh, imagine your real value is that you're someone John can talk to about the business. Yeah. You guys, I got it. I think it'd just be fun to be a fly on the wall on what, some random day when <laughs> you and John are, go at it, figuring out. I mean, he, he and I are uniquely compatible. We have strengths and weaknesses to complement each other. Um, and I think we've known that for a long time. So it's a real pleasure to work with him in a formal, uh, you know, he and I have worked together together on and off for a long time, but really to just be in the same organization is, is really right. good. Right. Um, and uh, I'm doing this uh, streaming thing. So Luke Peter Schmidt, who you know, and a guy named yes. uh, Will Luke. Kunkel that you don't. Um, every week we do a political stream. Um, yeah. I'm, I've been a political junkie for a long time. I have no right. credentials, never run for office, but I'm just really interested in it. So right. we do that. Um, I, I always enjoy your posts on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and then uh, my wife is a successful attorney in Everett. Um, I, I dragged her all around the world for over 15 years. And um, we came back to Seattle to, uh, to do the Gobbenworks deal with Paizo. Um, and she set down roots and got her firm up and running. And I'm pleased to be able to support her. Um, you know, it's time, my time to, to be her backstop. Um, mm -hmm. So it's pretty cool to watch her, you know, flourish and, and get all that stuff done. She sends her love, by the way. Yes, mm -hmm. love to Yeah. Um, my, my daughter, uh, you know, who was born um, a few years before Magic was released and um, used to ride her hippity hop around Wizards of the Coast. I remember her <laughs> as a child Tila. riding her hippity hop. Yeah, named after the character in Ringworld, yeah. the <laughs> luckiest girl in the universe. Um, she grew up and she's a nurse. She lives in California. So, like, success, like, yeah. can't, I can't, there's nothing I can point out in my life and say, well, that was a tragic error and, you know, like, yeah. just so lucky and fortunate to have done so many cool things. Right. Mm. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you for being on Fireside with us. It was awesome. It was thank great. Had a great time. All right. And thank you for joining us. Uh, wow. What a great guest uh, Ryan's been. So thanks. Thanks to Ryan. Thanks to Emma for being my co-host. Thanks to Will Geisler and Lauren Bond who are in the studio with us today, uh, making sure that we do a good job. Uh, we have uh, a full slate of shows coming up over the next week. So let me get out my list because now we have so many I can't memorize them all. Um, okay. So uh, we will have tonight here, right? Westgate Irregulars at 6.30 p.m. are going to be uh, here. Uh, it won't look like here because they use a different set. We're tricky that way. <laughs> um, Friday at 11 a.m. we have Table, table Takes. And uh, at 1 p.m. the news new release roundup with, uh, with Emma. We'll be back with you there. And... Uh, Friday night, 6 p.m. is a game night. We're starting to run games that we're going to stream, and I think it's an alien RPG. Yeah. And um, um, I won't be in it, but I'm going to be in, in the third episode of that game. And I think I'm going to end up running a game on RPG on a Friday night coming up. Um, and also Friday, we will be releasing a podcast of this episode uh, with Ryan Dancy. And um, uh, it will also be on our YouTube channel. And then Monday, we'll have the Brothers Murph back at 6 p.m. talking about board games. And then I'll be back on the 19th 
Fireside will return, and our guest will be Monty Cook. So thanks to everybody doing that. All right, that's our show for tonight. Good night. We'll see you 